Anyway, before I get going, I'd just like to thank Jonathan for having stepped in to the pulpit for the last three Sundays. Two were meant, but you had three. So uh, I haven't listened to all the sermons yet, but I'm getting there. But uh, thank you very, very much. And it's really nice to be part of a team so that uh, when one goes and another comes, then we can always be here and, and fill everything up. So we're delighted. And it's a real honor and privilege for me to be able to open the word tonight. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to hit probably one of the most important and uh, amazing texts in the whole New Testament, especially maybe the week to come and the week after, but it's all in the same chapter. I'll say no more. Let me pray, and then we'll hit it. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being here this evening, for the wonderful worship time we just had in song, Lord, for the reading of the word, the prayer time. Lord, we love you, and we do love to worship you. That is what a Christian loves to do. He loves to be with you and with your people. And so tonight, Lord, we're glad to be here, and we love hearing your word, and I pray that this evening you would speak to each and every one of us. Lord, you know our needs, you know our joys, you know our pains, you know our trials, and you can take your word through your Holy Spirit and apply it to us. So I pray you would do that now, in Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to take your Bibles and open them to John chapter 3. Um, We decided when we started the church that we would start a a gospel, the gospel of John, just so that we could kind of review the life of Jesus Christ. And we decided to do John, uh, the gospel of John. And so this evening we hit chapter three. I titled the sermon Nicodemus and the New Birth. Nicodemus and the New Birth. And we'll read chapter three, verses one through 10. And I'm reading, I'd just like to say this, from my new, okay, my brand new ESV Bible, okay, English Standard Version, that's kind of the Bible we're landing on. So I've changed Bibles, which is really complicated for me, and I have no tabs yet, so it might take a little longer for me to find verses tonight, but here we go. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Wow. Well, may God bless his word. We'll stop there for tonight. <clears throat> on November 2nd, 1976, I was standing personally on a street in New Delhi, India, when a Dutch missionary told me about Jesus Christ and the salvation he offered to me. I was a hippie traveling out there, And as I listened to him, my heart was struck by what I heard. And a few minutes later, right there in the street, I repented of my sins. I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins and to come and live inside me. At that instant, I was born again. And my life has never been the same since that instant. If you know Christ tonight personally, You've had the same experience, even if the circumstances were different. One day, you heard the gospel message. You turned to Jesus Christ, and you asked him to save you. Now, I don't know if you've thought much about this, but do you realize all that happened to you in that very instant when you asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and save you at the very moment you placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation? Actually, many things happen. I'm just going to list 11. 11 things happened, at least more, but this is why I'm going to bring it today. 
at that instant when you came to Christ. For example, first of all, conversion happened. When a person's eyes are open to the gospel and he sees his spiritual bankruptcy and his sin and understands the worthiness of Christ to forgive his sins, when he repents of his sins, turns away from them to embrace Christ by faith, that is called conversion. Second thing happened, substitution. Ooh, theological term, but you'll understand it. We all know that Jesus died on the cross and rose again the third day. But on that day of Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus actually took your place on the cross as your substitute. You see, you should have died for your own sin, but he died in your place. In John 10, 11, he said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. See, he was your substitute. Thirdly, reconciliation happened. The Bible says that before knowing Christ, you were an enemy of God. But when you were forgiven by Christ, you now became God's friend. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says it like this. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You were reconciled to God. Four, propitiation happened. Ooh, that's a big one too. Well, the Bible explains that God is angry at us because we have sinned against him. He who does not obey the Son or believe in him shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him, John 3 tells us, 336. But incredibly, Christ's death on the cross appeased God's wrath. He was satisfied by it. Thus, God's wrath no longer is set upon you or me. This is what we call propitiation. As 1 John 2.2 says, he himself is a propitiation for our sins. Five, Remission happened. Remission is another way of saying exemption from the eternal consequence of an offense. In fact, there are now no more consequences to my sin. Why not? Because I was forgiven by Christ. Remission is the suspension of penalty, the suspension of the hell I deserve. He who believes in him is not judged. John 3.18 Six, redemption happened. This all happened at the instant we came to Christ. That's what's kind of cool, okay? Redemption happened. Well, Christ paid the ransom price for you and purchased you from the slave market of sin and released you to be forgiven in Christ. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Seven, imputation happened. This is amazing. When Christ died on the cross, An invisible transaction took place. Jesus took our sin upon himself and in exchange gave us his righteousness. His righteousness, biblically, was imputed, put upon us, given to us. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Eight, adoption happened. In an instant, As we believed in Christ, the Bible says we were adopted as sons and daughters of God. Galatians 4, 5 says, He came that we might receive adoption to sonship. And Romans 8, 15, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as an own children. So I was not of God and now, boom, adopted as a child of God. Nine, justification happened. Justification is a judicial act of pronouncing someone just or acquitted or pronouncing them innocent without any possibility of condemnation. As Romans 5.1 says, listen, there is therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I was declared innocent by the work of Christ. Ten, sanctification happened. Sanctification means being set apart for a special use. It comes from the same root as saint or holy. So from the moment I came to Christ, I was actually set aside for a divine and holy purpose. That's what sanctification really is. And we, of course, it lasts a whole life. 1 Peter 1.16 says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And number 11, regeneration. 
So regeneration is the process whereby God, through a second birth, imparts to the believing sinner a new nature. So you didn't think you were getting a theological class here for the first six minutes of the sermon? But how rich is that? This was just like a free gift. All these things were just like given to you, boom, just like that, freely in an instant. Now, the last word I used is the word regeneration. And that is actually the theme of John chapter 3. Regeneration. And it's our text this evening. Another way of describing the idea of regeneration is a use, a word you've probably used or a phrase you've used many times and you've, you've heard. It's the idea of being born again. Born again. Jesus says it in John 3, 3. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is the theme of the new birth. Now in this passage... John 3, an amazing story is told about a man named Nicodemus. He's a Jewish religious leader, and he's confused about his spiritual journey. Simply simply put, he has a doubt about his eternity and whether or not he's going to see the kingdom of God, perhaps at death. He's, he's, He's wondering, huh, you know, am I in or not? In the kingdom or not? He was religious, a leader, But his heart was empty. We know that because he comes and interrogates Jesus about this this issue. And on this particular night, he took the risk of going to see Jesus to ask him some questions. And Jesus then tells him about the subject called the new birth or being born again. The context is important. Maybe you remember in John chapter 1, John began writing his gospel on the life of Jesus theologically. And his whole idea there was to show us that Jesus is God in human flesh. The Word was God, verse 1, and verse 14, the Word became flesh. Followed by the testimony of John the Baptist on the identity of Christ, and he calls his first disciples. In chapter 2, Jesus travels to Cana in Galilee to attend a wedding with his mother and performs what the Bible calls his first miracle. I call it the French miracle, okay? Because he turns water into really good wine, okay? And uh, everyone's blown away by the amount of wine and how good it is. But that really is what chapter 2 is all about. And from there, Jesus returns to Jerusalem and gets to the temple. And upon seeing the corrupt merchants and those using the temple actually as a shortcut to go to town to sell their goods, Jesus actually makes a whip, a real whip, And he began just kicking everybody out of that temple, and he just clears it out and condemns those religious leaders for allowing that commerce, bad commerce, and profiteering from this dishonest commerce. So this explains why in chapter 3, Nicodemus, who is one of those religious leaders, comes to Jesus by night. He's probably scared to be discovered by his colleagues as a potential Jesus follower. So we're going to look at this amazing story. And though this passage is a narrative, just a story of this man, I would like to suggest that this passage teaches us eight essential truths about the new birth. And this is really important because this is the core of what we believe, okay? So eight essential truths about the new birth or about being born again. And we're going to take them one at a time, okay? So number one. Number one, the first essential truth about the new birth, here it is, number one, the new birth is not a religion. The new birth is not a religion. Verse one says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So the question is, who is this man Nicodemus? Well, he was a Pharisee, um, a Jewish, and and the Pharisees were a Jewish religious party whose motto was, external religious rigor. For them, this was man's ultimate goal, to keep every aspect of the law down to the smallest detail. That was their goal, all of them. But their legalism became reprehensible. Jesus said to them in Matthew 15, 3, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? 
You see, they took the commandments of God and added all these details which made it actually impossible to follow them. So Nicodemus was a very religious, very pious man attempting to obey every commandment in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And it says in verse 1, he was a leader or a ruler of the Jews. That means he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 70-member decision-making body or the Supreme Court of the Jews, if you want. And the fact that he was a leader or a ruler here also indicates that he was one of the distinguished teachers of this group. And that's what verse 10 says also. This means he was an expert of the law, a gifted teacher, and recognized as such. So he was famous, well-known, one of Israel's greats. And yet, the outward image of a person can be very misleading. I mean, you look at the guy and you're going, wow, what a man of God. That's what it looked like. You see, one can give the appearance that all is well, when in reality, not all is well. And that was the case with Nicodemus. Although he was one of the highest ranking doctors of the law in the Sanhedrin, he actually questions his own spirituality and his own eternal destiny. See, his religion actually left him empty. He was working real hard, but he always felt there was something missing. We learned something very simple here. The new birth is not a religion. You see, a religion is simply an attempt for man to please God by doing good works, hoping that God will notice how good and religious we are, or you are. I mean, that's not my case because I'm born again, praise the Lord. But, you know, the whole idea with religion is, I'm going to try and do as good as I can, and then at the end, God will look at me and go, ah, oh, you are a good person, you get into heaven. The question and the problem with that is, where is the line? Where is the line? Where is the line to say, ah, I made it, no, but you didn't? That's the question. The problem is, you see, the Bible says that we are all sinners, all of us, born sinners. And therefore, we cannot work ourselves into heaven by good works. Why? Because here's the red line. Perfection. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, God is perfectly holy. So the only way someone could spend eternity in the presence of a holy God is for him to be holy. Do you know anyone who's holy? Perfectly holy. James says, you commit one sin, it's as if you committed the entire sin of the entire law. No one is holy except Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. And Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. See, working your way to heaven is impossible because you can never be good enough, ever. That's why I tell people, and they're sometimes shocked. I tell them, I'm a pastor, but I, I hate religion. I really dislike religion. They go, excuse me, you're a pastor and you hate religion? Yeah. They don't understand my definition of religion. Religion is working your way to heaven. You can't do it. So that's the first essential truth. Number two, second essential truth about the new birth. The new birth means being born again. The new birth means being born again or born from above. Verse 2. Excuse me, I just need to blow my nose. This is wonderful. I didn't realize there was Kleenex right there. <laughs> this is nice. When you borrow a church, some things are really, really good. So I'll put that in my pocket. Um, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, there, there are a lot of things of importance here. It's really interesting. So first of all, Nicodemus, as I already mentioned, comes to Jesus by night, probably afraid to be seen by his colleagues, like as a Jesus sympathizer. So anyway, so he comes by night. And look at Jesus' conclusion. I'm sorry, Nicodemus' conclusion about Jesus in verse 2. 
So he comes to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. So he says, I know that you are a teacher, therefore a doctor. He calls him rabbi, actually. And he affirms that I believe that you have come from God. That's quite a significant statement. In other words, he believed that Jesus taught, Jesus taught God's law correctly since he came from God. And he concludes, therefore, as he says, that he is actually from God. That is what he says. So that means he does not believe that Jesus is some kind of imposter or a false prophet. He says, no, no, you are really from God. He also concludes this, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He thus perceived that it was the power of God that was animating Jesus, not any other possible power. Because he says, your miracles are from God. And you go, but what miracles? Well, we don't actually know which signs Nicodemus had seen Jesus perform or had heard that Jesus had performed because up until this point, Jesus had only done one miracle, the one of changing the water into wine in John chapter 2. Doubtful that he was there, maybe he was, we don't know. Whatever happened, he is convinced that Jesus is actually doing miracles. Now, it's not surprising because in Acts chapter 4 and verse 16, it's, uh, the, the, the Pharisees were talking and they say, quote, What shall we do with these men? For that is a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. So even here in Acts 4, the Jews are realizing, okay, this guy is really doing miracles. Nobody can deny it. So it was pretty obvious that Jesus was doing miracles. People reacted to two ways. Some people believed as the disciples is in John chapter 2. Others, according to John eleven fifty three wanted to kill Jesus because they finally knew that he was from God and he was denouncing their false religion. So what's interesting here is that Nicodemus concludes that the miracles or signs performed were in fact true, legitimate, and from God. And that's kind of what made Nicodemus wonder about this guy, Jesus Christ. In verse 3, Jesus answers, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Does that surprise you, that answer? See, to me, this answer seems kind of out of context, honestly. Nicodemus says to Jesus that the miracles Jesus performed convinces him that he's from God, but then Jesus like, answers, besides the question, you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. So I, I think... Jesus is answering a question that Nicodemus did not ask. In John 2, verse 24 and 25, we find out Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. You see, Jesus as God in human flesh, as God incarnate, could read hearts. So he knew the inside of Nicodemus' thinking here. He knew him perfectly well. He could see the deeper need. Remember Psalm 139.4, even before the word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. This is true of Jesus. He knew everything before we talk, before we think. He knows everything. So actually, Jesus is answering a question that looks like Nicodemus was asking in his heart or in his mind. So what's the question? Here it is. How can a man see the kingdom of God? Actually, it should be perhaps inserted between verse 1 and 2. He came to Jesus by night, said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Please, this is not in the text, but this could be probably the question he's answering in his heart. Please tell me, how can a man see the kingdom of God? Answer of Jesus, verse 2, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Wow, Jesus knew that standing right in front of him, there's one of the top-notch leaders of the entire country, a Jewish man who wasn't sure of his own salvation. Unbelievable. 
So what does Jesus tell them? You need to be born again. Well, that leads to a very important question. What on earth does that mean? I mean, what does it mean to be born again? Well, the phrase born again, literally in the original, means to be born from above, which is kind of what it says here, right? Born from above. In fact, in in, in Mark 15, 38, we read that the temple veil, when Jesus died, was torn in two from top to bottom. Same word as used, from top to bottom. So he was born from the top or above. So being born again means literally being born from above. You must be heavenly born. We have been earthly born. We all are humans. We're alive. We had a mom. We had a dad. We were born. But to see the kingdom of God, Jesus says, verse 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Now, maybe you're going, ah, oh, that's kind of weird. You know, is that, is that really in the Bible? Oh, yeah, it's really in the Bible. And to make sure that you really pay attention to this, Jesus starts it by saying, truly, truly, I say to you. It's like underline, red pen, hello, listen, don't miss this. Now, you might be surprised at those words. Actually, in, in the original, it's not truly, truly. You know what it is? Amen, amen. Amen, amen, I say to you. Well, you're going, that's kind of weird, because usually we use amen at the end of prayers. He's beginning it here at the beginning of a statement. Well, the word amen actually is an expression of complete and total agreement. When we say amen at the end of a prayer, someone prays and we go amen, we're going, yes, total agree with that prayer. But Jesus is saying, what I'm about to say is absolute truth. He's not just saying, believe me, this is true. He's saying, I know this is true firsthand, and you need to know this. He can say that because we already saw in chapter 1 that he is God in human flesh. He knows how heaven operates. In fact, John 1.3 tells us, this is amazing, all things were made through him, that is Jesus Christ, and without him was not anything made that was made. I mean, Jesus is the creator of everything. He knows how everything works. And believe me, he knows how heaven works and he knows how to get people into heaven. So what is Jesus saying here? Quite simply saying that every man or woman must have a physical birth to live. But to be able to see the kingdom of God, you must go through another birth that is not physical. It's a birth from above, a spiritual birth, what we call a new birth. And listen, without this new birth, it is impossible, impossible to see the kingdom of God. As one commentator put it, as a blind man cannot see a physical sunset, so a natural man cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. You must be born from above. And this is very biblical. I mean, for example, in John 1, in verse 11, he came to his own, talking about Jesus, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, we have to be born of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, anyone, uh, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And 1 John 5.1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So what do we learn from this verse? It's amazing how much you can get packed in these verses. First of all, we learn there is a kingdom of God. It's a kingdom where God dwells. It does indeed exist. It is a dwelling place of God. Because Jesus says, it is possible then to see the kingdom of God. It is possible to enter the kingdom where God lives. Verse 3 says it. That means it's accessible. 
But we also learned that all men do not enter it automatically. It's not just automatic. No. There's a condition to enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Those who are born again will see the kingdom of God. Those who are not born again will not see the kingdom of God. That's what he says. This is an absolute truth. Because Jesus affirms it with the formula, truly, truly, or amen, amen. And interestingly, we also find out that access to the kingdom of heaven is not the consequence of any effort or a line of conduct or a code or moral obedience or religious affiliation or some kind of observance. No effort made. The only way to see the kingdom of God is to be reborn and to experience spiritual transformation. I love stuff that's black and white. This is black and white. It's like really clear. I love that. Now you go, but why? Why do we need to be born again to see the kingdom of God? Well, I've already actually answered that question. It's because of the corruption of the human nature. See, we're all born sinners. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, can an Ethiopian change his skin and a leopard his spots? He can't. It's impossible. Then he says, can you also do good, you who are trained to do evil? Have you ever tried to live a perfect life? This is what the world would say, good luck. <laughs> I mean, wow, try to live a perfect life? Deed, words, thoughts, it's impossible. Impossible. The Bible says we're all sinners. We're all condemned sinners. And there is nothing we can do. We cannot rub our spots off and rub our sin off. You can do anything you want to try and do. You cannot do it. It's impossible. No. Ephesians 2.1 says we are dead before God. Ephesians 2.3 says we are children of wrath. Ephesians 2.2 2 says we are sons of rebellion. And Romans 5.12 says we are afflicted by Adam's sinful nature. Ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible for you to remove your own sin. Impossible. And the wages of sin is death. You deserve to die physically, which you will die physically unless the rapture comes first, and die spiritually, be condemned by the wrath of God because that is what our sin deserves. Unless, unless we are born again from above. Think about this. Does a child contribute anything to his birth? No. One day he's just born. Can a person contribute anything to their spiritual birth? No. It's got to be from God, from above. God does it. Well, now Nicodemus is totally confused, okay? I mean, he's not understanding what Jesus is saying at all. We know that by his response in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, he just doesn't get it. What he concludes is obvious. Uh, excuse me, Jesus, physical rebirth, I think that is like totally impossible. Good, Nicodemus, that is exactly right. You got that one right. It's impossible. So therefore, the rebirth that Jesus is talking about must necessarily be something else. It's not a physical thing. So what is it? Well, he says it in verse 5. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There are several possibilities of interpreting this verse 5. The water and the Spirit. What does that mean, to be born of water and of the Spirit? Some conclude that the water here is a reference to baptism. We don't hold to that view because we believe that baptism follows conversion as a symbol of our death and resurrection of Christ. It doesn't contribute to our salvation at all. Others conclude that water refers to physical birth and the spirit to spiritual birth. Due to verse 6, right? That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Um, it kind of, it could look like He's saying every person to see the kingdom of God must have two births. 
birth in water and birth in the Spirit. So what does that mean? Well, probably to those who hold this interpretation, probably talking about the waters, the mother's waters. He seems to be making a direct link between verse 5 and 6, which means that natural birth corresponds to the birth by water. Um, the Greek word for by water can be translated born of the waters, apparently. So, is it saying you could be must be born once first physically, once spiritually? That's the second possibility. The third possibility, there's a third view, it just simply refers to cleansing. Cleansing. In other words, water and, and, and spirit is really referring to the same thing. In Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, it says this, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So here God is promising to Ezekiel six centuries before Jesus that a time is coming when there will be a transformative new beginning, a spectacular cleansing symbolized by water that washes away sin and impurities and idols and the spirit that gives a brand new heart. And so could these two words, water and spirit, really be referring to what happens at the moment you're born again, you trust Christ as your Savior and, and Lord, and at that instant, all your sins are washed away and you receive a brand new heart. You are born again. There's now a, a new John Glass in me. I'm John Glass physical, and boom, that instant, a new John Glass just appeared in me. So the bottom line on this second point is that the new birth means being born again. It leads to a third essential truth. Third essential truth in this passage. The new birth is invisible, yet very real. In verse 7, look what he says. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So, you know, as he was talking about this, Nicodemus's face must just had a really weird expression because Jesus is reading it. He's going, whoa, Nicodemus, I can tell you are completely lost. Okay? I mean, he must have been perplexed. He would not have said, Jesus would not have said, do not marvel. Don't be surprised. If I told you, you must be born again. He's probably going, whoa, what are you talking about here, Jesus? I don't get this. Then verse 8, Jesus says this. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What's he saying here? What a brilliant illustration. I've used this so many times when I try and explain the gospel to people. Okay, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen the wind? I mean, I'm asking you this question. Have you ever seen the wind? Ah, trick question. Ha ha. Trick question. That's exactly what Jesus did, 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 did Dickonemus. Trick question. Actually, you cannot see the wind. But you can feel it. We can feel its effects. We can know the wind is blowing when you hear it, like, you know, whistling through your shutters at home, if you got old shutters like us. We know there's wind when you see the leaves ruffling in the trees. You know there's wind when you see a flag flapping on a pole. Or you know there's a lot of wind when you're trying to protect yourself with an umbrella and the wind comes contrary and blows that umbrella contrary and, and it, you know, it, it goes like boom and you feel really stupid now because everyone's watching you holding this umbrella the wrong way you know there's been a lot of wind there. Well, this is true of the new birth. It's invisible. But man, oh man, can it be seen because the effects are so real. So you might ask the question, well, if a man does become born again, what will be some of the physical, visible effects of his new birth? Let me just give you a few. If you are born again, what happens? 
Well, as I mentioned earlier, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So you're going to be a new creation. When you are converted to Jesus Christ, when you are born again, when that new birth happens through Christ, you are a new creation. This is a new you. 1 John 5.1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So what happens? First of all, first of all, you will believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's the first thing that will happen. You will have believed, obviously, right? You're born again. But now you are absolutely certain. You, you, you know. I mean, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is my God in human flesh. He is my Savior. You know that. Number two. 1 John 5, 1b. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Oh, this is interesting. If you're born again, this verse says, you will love others who have been born of God. So as a born-again Christian, you will love other born-again Christians. What does that mean? That means you're going to love church. You're going to love Christians. You're going to love being with Christians. They, they, they will become your family. Three, 1 John 3, 9 says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Wow. You know what he's saying here? If you are born again, you cannot go on sinning like you were sinning before you became born again. Because Jesus Christ will put the spotlight on your sin. He's going to forgive you of that sin. And from that instant, you will begin to hate your sin. And you will love holiness. Wow. It will keep you from a life of wanton sin. Oh, you'll not live a perfect life but you will hate your sin more and more. And the pattern of your life will change radically. Sin will no longer be a dominant pattern, but holiness will be. Sin will become the exception. Holiness will become the norm. And you're going to love the Bible more and more. Why? Because the Bible will show you what your sin is and will show you what holiness is and you will love reading about holiness and wanting to be holy. That happens automatically when you become born again. Four. 1 John 2, 29. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. You will love practicing what is right. You want to do what's right and just and correct in your business, in your home, in your family. Just, I want to be truthful. Number five, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Wow, it's almost like point number two there. If you're born again, you will be known, listen to this, for your love for other people. You will start loving other people. Maybe you hate people. Maybe you're the kind of person, you're kind of a grump, and you're, you're, you're always like bashing people. Suddenly, you start loving everybody. They're going, whoa, what happened to you? Because you've changed. You start loving people. Number six, 1 John 5, 3, 4. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. So he's talking about, again, that a Christian loves to obey the commandments, and they're not burdensome. Wow, it's such a relief. It's like you're reading the Bible, you're going, oh, wow, you know, I, I'm supposed to do this because the Bible says it. I can't wait to do this. This is what a Christian loves. He loves keeping the commandments, and it's not a burden. It's a joy. He's joyously keeping the commandments of God. Seven, 1 John 5, 4, and for everyone that has been born of God overcomes the world. You know what that means? You have the ability to overcome the pressures and temptations that the world would otherwise keep you from keeping God's word. You can actually resist temptation like you couldn't before. Number eight, there's yet another result. 1 John 5, 18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. Wow. You know what that means? The Bible says, 1 Peter 5, 8, 
Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour you. So, Satan is out to get you. But you know what? If you're born again, the evil one does not touch you. That's what it says. Oh, he can, he can try. He, he can accuse you. Revelation 12.10. But you know what? 1 John 4, 4 says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know what? We have Christ in us. Satan, you're out of here. So, what's the summary here? You're a born-again Christian, you will automatically believe that Jesus is the Christ. You'll refrain from a life pattern of continual habitual sin. You will start manifesting a life of righteousness and holiness. You will begin to manifest joy. Following the commandments will not be a burden, but a pleasure to obey God. You will love God's commandments, which implies you'll be reading your Bible, going to Bible study, attending church regularly, because that is where you learn about this, and this is what you love. You will love God's people. Oh, even if you've been hurt in churches by believers, this happens also. Churches are unfortunately not always perfect. We know that. But if it happens, it doesn't matter. You get back up, and you keep going. Absolutely, you love God's people. You love reconciling if possible and moving on. And you will also overcome the temptations of the world and you will be kept from harm of Satan's ways. I mean, that's just like the orders. There's so much more I can say. I'm just kind of running out of time here. I mean, it's amazing. You know about the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is another thing that's just given to you, love. Love, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You can love those who are unlovable. Joy. You, maybe you were bitter, but now you can have joy. Peace. Maybe you were anxious, but now you have peace. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, gifts from God. How about those who are not born again? How about those who fake Christianity? Well, there are plenty of those. But you know what? You can only fake it for so long. It's really hard to fake this. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. Faking this day in and day out, ooh, it's really hard. Eventually, the true colors will be seen. Now, you're not born again. You're trying not born again. You just need to let Christ come in. Let you be born again. Get a new life, a new you. And boy, he will start pouring all these things out in your life in an amazing way. Not perfectly. You'll always be confessing. Always. Always. Because you're just, oh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not where I want to be. But it's okay. He will keep growing you in all these When I became a believer in India, I came back to my college dorm friends in New York. I mean, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes. I was 19 years old. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I quit smoking. I was smoking a lot of dope and hashish and drugs and stuff. Stopped all that. I swore a lot. Horrible mouth. I just cussed in the name of God and Christ all the time. God began to work on my mouth. Debauchery. I mean, I, I, my, my life of sin just completely started changing. And now I love Bible study. <laughs> I, I had a Bible and I just kept reading it all the time. And I, I was going to Bible study. I was going to church. My friends thought I was like nuts. They thought, what happened to John? You know what I answered them? I was born again in New Delhi, India. And my life completely changed. They had no answer. They had no answer. Actually, I lost all those friends with time. But I gained so many more in Christ. I became born again. So my question to you this evening is very simple. Here it is. Are you born again? Are you born again? Jesus said in verse 3, right? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you have a question about whether you're born again or not, please come and see me or Jonathan or Frank or anyone. Just, just, just talk to us. We would love to help you know how you can become born again. So that leads to the fourth essential truth. We're only at point three here, remember? Well, what's the fourth essential truth about the new birth? Well, to find out, you'll have to come back next Sunday because we just don't have time to do it right now. So if next Sunday we're just going to continue, there's going to be a lot more to say. I can't wait. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you so much for this amazing passage, for the clarity of everything you teach, Lord. And I pray if there's someone here this evening that is not born again, that is not born from above, that maybe this evening would be the moment where they say, wow, wow, I'm a sinner. I, I, I've tried. I've tried just getting myself in heaven, but it's just not working. Oh, Lord, tonight I understand that Jesus, you, who died on the cross and rose again from the dead, Lord, you can come into me and give me a new life so that I would become a child of God. I pray that someone who does not know Christ tonight would do that. And Lord, we thank you for the rest of this service now, and we bless you for all that you have given us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.